Welcome to Adventures in Life. I'm your host, Earl Beecher. We have a very special guest. He's written a book, and I had the privilege of reading this book in the last couple of weeks, and I want to share with you it is a fascinating book. It's called The Diary of a Frontline Chaplain. And I was so impressed that I asked Chaplain Mortensen to join us. His name is Benjamin F. Mortensen, and he was a chaplain in the U.S. Army during the Korean conflict. That's right. And frontline chaplain. You weren't kidding when you entitled this book, and you weren't kidding when you called it a diary. Why did you call it a diary? Well, the book consists of letters that I sent home to my wife, daily letters. Uh, I would crawl into my bunker at night and uh, write the events of the day and then uh, send them to her and uh, asked her to save them. She saved them in a shoebox. I was going to give her the credit for being smart enough to <laughs> save these because they are fascinating. Yeah. They are absolutely fascinating, mm -hmm. the things that happen. Before we get into the frontline situation, how does one, what, what is a chaplain and how does one become one? Well, in my case, uh, I'd been drafted into the Army and took basic training at Fort Ord. California. Uh, there was a chaplain there that told me there was a shortage of chaplains in the service. And so I filled out an application and then I got my church to uh, give me an ecclesiastical endorsement. And uh, then I just kind of forgot about it. And after I completed basic training, I got into the CIC uh, as a uh, language uh, interpreter. You, you were bilingual? Yes, I could speak Spanish. I had a degree in Romance Languages from Brigham Young University. All right. Had a degree in Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Well, okay, that's, bi <laughs> that's tri quadruple lingual. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Uh, I was on my way, actually, to Lisbon, Portugal, to a United Nations meeting and was on the ship ready to sail the following morning when two big old MPs came on and uh, <laughs> they rapped at my door and they said, we're looking for Private Mortensen. And I thought, hey, though, what have I done now? <laughs> What's going on here? And I just closed the door. I said, he's, he's not here. <laughs> and they rapped again and they said, are you Private Mortensen? And I said, uh, yes, I am. And they said, we want you to get dressed, pack your gear, and come with us. And I said, oh, no, I can't do that. I said, I'm going to Lisbon, Portugal in the morning. And they said, no, we have orders. And they reached in their uh, coat pocket and pulled out orders, uh, sending me to uh, Camp... Uh, well, I forget the name. It's of the been camp. a while. Which, yeah. uh, in Fort New Jersey. Mama's? Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, okay, I thought you mentioned New Jersey, so. Uh, and this is the uh, fort where men uh, depart for uh, countries uh, east. Oh. Okay. Yeah. More, more in the European. Uh, right. Are, okay, European center of action. And so I stayed there for three weeks, not really knowing uh, what I was doing there. But in the back of my mind, I, I remembered having filled out this application for the chaplain school. Yes. And men would come through the barracks and they'd say, what are you doing in here? i said, I don't know. Waiting. Yeah. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd make up stories. I'd say, uh -huh. I think I'm waiting to be court-martialed. <laughs> ah, they say, you poor guy. <laughs> oh, and dear. on another occasion, I said, I'm waiting to go to West Point. Uh oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, okay. And on another occasion, uh, one of them asked me what I was doing. I said, I think I'm waiting to become a chaplain. And they said, oh, you poor guy, you know, why would you want to do that, you know? Well, what's so bad about that? Well, apparently in their mind, or in this person's mind, that wouldn't be very glamorous duty, or it wouldn't be very uh, important duty, or, uh, and yet it turned out to be one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. I would imagine so. So, you were at Fort Monmouth, and then you became a chaplain. Yes, I, I received orders making me a first lieutenant overnight 
and a chaplain. And suddenly you were sir instead oh, of hey yeah. you. Huh? <laughs> people saluted me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my orders sent me to Fort Slocum, New York, which was where the chaplain school was located. Now, you said you went to the BY, Brigham Young University. Why? Right. And I understand you played football there. Right, I played two years. Uh, you were Steve Young's predecessor. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but I did play quarterback. You did? Okay. And, uh, so upon, you're used to the teamwork. Oh, yes. And interestingly enough, upon graduation, uh, the Los Angeles Rams sent me a letter uh, telling me that uh, they would like me to c come for a tryout. And if I could make their team, they would offer me a $25,000 per season contract. That was pretty good money back in the days oh, of the Korean War. That was all the money in the world as far as I was concerned. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yet you got drafted, so you could not accept it. Is that About what happened? a week later, I get a, a letter from Uncle Sam Greetings. saying, you, you have been drafted. You're to report to Fort Ord, California for basic training. I see. Now... If you were at the Brigham Young University, I assume you were with the, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes. Uh, now, do they have a formal clergy? No, there is no paid ministry in the Mormon Church. Uh, we select leaders from the ranks, you know, from just our common everyday membership. Now, a chaplain has to be an ordained minister. Yes, uh, but in, in my case, I had filled a mission. Where? Uh, in Argentina. Uh, that was a two-and-a-half-year mission in those days. I understand there are two-year missions you, now. You had filled a mission? Yes. The church calls you? To, to go to Argentina as a missionary. I think most of us have seen uh, the, the Mormon elders around on bicycles and things, so right. we know who they are. Is, were you one of those? I was one of those. Oh, uh -huh. okay. At a very uh, early age, actually I was uh, 17 when I was called. I didn't turn 18 until I got into the country of Argentina and spent two and a half years down there uh, uh, proselyting for the church and making friends. So, so you had a college degree. Right. And you had filled a mission. And right. as long as the church gave you endorsement, then the chaplain's corps said, that's good enough. Because I've been under the impression most chaplains had to graduate from a seminary. No. Uh, at least not uh, uh, the, the chaplains uh, from the LDS church or the Mormon church. Okay. Now, what happened then? Uh, that church is not a Protestant church. No, uh, but I was considered a Protestant chaplain. There are three divisions in uh, the chaplain's corps, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish. And so all the Mormon chaplains fell under the Protestant category. And according to army definition, there ain't no other way. That's it's right. Catholic, right. Protestant, or Jewish. You will be one of those three. That's right. I said, what about the Buddhists? Where do they fit in? <laughs> well, uh, as far as I know, we didn't have any Buddhists. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Now, uh, you were then at the Fort Slocum Chaplain School. S school. Then what happened? Well, then I received orders uh, shipping me to the Far East Command in uh, uh, the, the Orient. And uh, I ended up in Korea with the 65th Regiment of the American 3rd Division. Now, it's about that point, I think, where the book starts. Yes. And so I want to get into this book with you. Right. in some detail, but they tell me it's time for a public service announcement. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Chaplain Ben Mortensen. Our guest is Chaplain Ben Mortensen. Ben, I've been looking at the front cover here, this picture of you. You look very young there. How old were you? I was 24 at the time. Uh, and they all called you Padre, huh? Oh, yes. Uh, I was with a, a Puerto Rican regiment. And most of these men were 
Catholic, and they all spoke Spanish, and I can speak Spanish. I grew up speaking Spanish and uh, had filled a mission to Argentina where they speak Spanish. And, uh, and you also majored on it in school, yes. Spanish and so forth. Right. Um, you were with this Puerto Rican outfit. Now, a Mormon chaplain with a Puerto Rican outfit who were mostly Catholic, weren't they? Yes. And the Army classified you as Protestant. That's right. Is the Mormon Church a Protestant church? No. Uh, actually, uh, we do not uh, claim to be Protestants. The Protestant churches uh, protested against the Catholic Church, and we never protested against the Catholic so Church. So you were closer to the Catholics than the, pro than the typical Protestants, but you did hold Protestant services. That's right. Uh, we held services uh, for all of the Protestant men in our battalion and regiment uh, in conjunction with all of the other Protestant chaplains that were assigned. Uh, you mean you were working with Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalians and... That's right. And uh, mm -hmm. every other group. That's right. Uh, including joint services. Joint services. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then that sort of clarifies something. I had some friends asking me the other day uh, about... You know, I told them about the book, and they said, well, are, are the Mormons Christian? But if you're holding joint services with all of the other Protestant groups, I guess you were. Oh, definitely. Uh, uh, to our way of thinking, we're uh, uh, the most Christian church in the world. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so you do believe in Christ, and then you were holding joint services with the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians. Yes. And, okay, now, how do you hold a service in the front line? Because according to this book, when I read it, you were placed, uh, your unit was hit very hard by enemy action, like within the first day or two that you were up front. That's right. How bad was it? Well, we lost uh, practically the entire regiment. We had to come off the front and uh, get replacement troops for all the men that were either injured or killed. You had a lot of casualties. Very, uh, yes, a uh, considerable number of casualties. Was this due to actually the hordes of people running at you with bayonets or shooting, or was it due to enemy artillery, or how personal was the fighting? There was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. There was. But prior to the hand-to-hand -hand combat, their artillery would uh, shoot shells into uh, our positions, and of course we would do the same, uh, shoot shells into their positions. And then we would meet in the middle for hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, you know, men with fixed bayonets going after each other. I have heard that there were almost as many casualties, men, men killed, in the Korean conflict as there were in the Vietnamese. Yes, uh, we had actually uh, 54,000 plus American soldiers killed in the Korean War. Yeah, they don't call it a war. This was a police action. This was a police action. Yeah, that makes me upset. It was not a declared war. Yeah. But people die in those police actions just as deadly, you know, as they do in, in real declared wars. Well, about what most folks know of the Korean conflict came from a TV series called MASH. Yes. Is that a fairly accurate presentation? Well, uh, not really. It may have uh, had a lot of uh, actual uh, experiences that went on in those MASH hospitals, you know. But they were back from the lines quite a way, weren't they? Quite a ways, They yes. They weren't up in the front the way you were? No. No, the only thing we had up front were forward aid stations where we would take them in as they came off the front and do what we could for them uh, and then either ship them back on a, uh, on, on a jeep, a litter jeep, or take them to a helicopter pad and fly them back to a MASH hospital. Okay, now I've got a couple of questions. I, I read your book. And a chaplain is a non-combatant, does not carry a weapon, and yet you were right up in the very front with the guys that were fighting hand-to-hand? -hand. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get yourself into that predicament? Well, I felt that that's where I belong. That's where I was needed. 
although my commanding officer, every time he'd see me, he'd say, Chaplain, you go on back. You know, you don't belong up here. And I'd say, yes, I do. You know, I need to be here. And, uh, yeah, but you described some personal reactions to this war when you first got there. When I first joined the 65th Regiment, we really suffered a lot of casualties, and it made me sick. I broke out in hives. I, uh, I was vomiting. I had diarrhea. Uh, you know, it, it not only affects your mental state, it affects your entire physical body. You can't see people blown up, shot stabbed, torn apart, going through, besides the dead, the mental anguish that some of the people were going through and not be affected. Oh. The book brings it out. Yes. I, 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 I had the feelings uh, with you be, because your letters were so detailed. Yes. And they were current. They were happening right there at that moment. That's true. Yes, that's very true. Yes. And I was trying to, to write to my wife to tell her what was going on there uh, without trying to, uh, you know, upset her unduly. Uh, I wish the whole American public would be upset unduly. <laughs> Maybe it would change the way that we conducted the war or right. something. Uh, but, you know, once I made up my mind that I was going to stay up on the front lines and do what I could to help these Puerto Rican soldiers. Uh, my hives went away, uh, my health got better, uh, and it was the first time I, I realized what the emotions can do to the physical body, you know. Uh, your mind can make you sick, but it can also make you well. And uh, once I was determined to stick it out. I got well. Have you found that this has made you stronger in throughout the rest of your life, having passed through this experience? Very much stronger. Uh, I, I got hardened, and this is one of the the sad parts and the bad parts of war, is that after a while, you you see dead bodies and they no longer affect you, at least. They didn't affect me like they did initially. I just took that as a matter of course, you know. And, uh, and again, that's, that's one of the bad things that comes out of a war. What are the good things that came out of this? Well, for me, uh, and I mentioned that in the book, it was the most spiritual experience of my life. Uh, and I saw these brave men perform feats of heroism that uh, you just can't believe some of these stories. Uh, there was one or two in there. There was one about a big black officer, a 300 pound man, that a single smaller, much smaller man went back after the officer was wounded and carried him back to safety. He picked him up, cradled him over his shoulder, climbed up the hill and saved his life. That was a very touching story. Oh. Yes. I still get emotional when I think of that. Yeah. Now, another thing, Ben, you have the Silver Star. Yes. That was awarded to you. How does a non-combatant wind up with a Silver Star? That's very unusual for a chaplain. Uh, at the end of uh, the war, and the, the armistice was signed on the 27th of July of 1953. Uh, it was signed at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we had 12 hours to clean out a buffer zone one mile on each side of the MLR, the main line of resistance. Somebody got the bright idea that uh, let's just fire all of our ammo at the enemy, and they fired all of their ammo at us. And during that 12-hour period... After the ceasefire was after signed? After the ceasefire was signed. They were still firing. We were still firing. Yeah. And, and we, we fired at each other for 12 hours. And thousands along that 155-mile front there were killed after the armistice had been signed. On the very day that the peace was... One of my lieutenants got hit in the head with a piece of shrapnel, and it just scalped him. Just I, I want to pause.
Stay with us. We're going to be right back. I want to get into this story. We're going to have a public service announcement. Dan is giving me the signals, so bear with us. We'll be right back with Chaplain Ben Martinson. Chaplain Ben Mortensen is about to tell us how he came to win the Silver Star. How did it happen? One of our lieutenants, uh, his name was Lieutenant Jay, was hit in the forehead with a piece of shrapnel and it just scalped him. It just tore off the front of his head. Ooh. And I saw him get hit and so I went over and uh, picked him up and carried him to the aid station. Uh, we took off all of his clothes to see if he had other shrapnel wounds in his body. And then we covered him with a, an army blanket and then began immediately to uh, begin transfusions of whole blood. Two men who were litter bearers picked him up and I was holding the two uh, bottles of blood and uh, we went outside of our uh, uh, bunker, which was our aid station, and just as we were getting ready to put him on, on the litter, uh, a volley of rounds, mortar rounds, came in, and uh, everyone scrambled away, and uh, I... Uh, Here you were standing. I was standing with two bottles of blood. Yes. And so I took my helmet off, and I put it on this man's forehead, uh, resting it on the bridge of his nose and the back of his head so it wouldn't... Uh, uh, do any damage to his forehead to the room. and then I laid on top of him and a round came in and it just blew us away and uh, I don't know how long I was unconscious but it was uh, a few seconds and then I uh, woke up and I looked around and there was Lieutenant Jay about 20 yards away and I scrambled over to him and I picked him up again and brought him back and I called for the stretcher bearers to come and we finally got him on uh, the litter jeep the litter jeep transported him to a helicopter pad and then they flew him to a MASH hospital that specialized in head wounds. Did and he survive? He lived. He lived. He did survive. He did survive. Uh, we never heard uh, what the extent of his injuries were. I, I'm sure he must have sustained a lot of uh, uh, mental brain damage, uh, motor damage, but he did live and someone saw this and gave you the award? Yes, uh, it was my battalion commander and he wrote up the citation and, uh, and after the war we held a, a parade and unbeknownst to me, uh, uh, the uh, general of the third division, a general writings, came up and pinned a silver star on me and <laughs> I, I was totally flabbergasted. Yeah. I think that's marvelous. I want to come back to the book. The book is full of stories, very touching stories. Right. And you wrote them at the time to your wife and shared right. them. You must have had in the back of your mind someday you wanted to do a book. Perhaps, although I didn't consciously uh, write the stories for that purpose. No, they're, they're personal letters. Right. Uh, what made you decide to publish the book now? I kept reading in the newspaper uh, and seeing uh, people refer to the Korean War as the Forgotten War. And yet two million people died from 1950 to 1953. These were soldiers and civilians on both sides of the fighting. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica says that this was one of the bloodiest wars in the history of the world. Uh, and I thought, how can you forget this? How can you forget what our American troops did in Korea to bring peace to that country as well as to the entire world. And so I decided to get those letters out and uh, make them into a book. Have you seen Korea or talked to any Korean people recently to, to see what the net effect of all of that sacrifice has been able to do? I, I haven't. I, I went back to Korea in 1978 and saw how they had rebuilt their country. It was just beautiful. Seoul was completely rebuilt. It's a beautiful city today. Uh, Chorwon, where we did most of our fighting, is a rebuilt city. There's a freeway from Chorwon to Seoul that looks like one of our uh, 
American freeways. So uh, some good did come out of the war? A tremendous amount of good. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, American dollars had a lot to do with that. I hope so, yes. Uh, the book, I think, is available at almost any of the major bookstores. Right, especially uh, Barnes & Noble. They've got it, all right. And the Deseret bookstores. Oh, okay. And, and any uh, bookstore that deals in LDS or Mormon literature. Or in general, because this is not strictly for a Mormon audience. No. No. I thoroughly enjoyed the book and I recommend it. I want to thank you for being our guest today, Chaplain Benjamin Martinson, on Adventures in Life. And I want to thank you for joining us for Adventures in Life also. Please join us soon again for more adventures. Ben, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>